Hi, and thanks for joining me. This is the show where regular people like yourself get to share real experiences and insights about pain and life. In these casual conversations, we're usually talking about a type of pain that strikes from out of the clear blue, while we're just living life, often doing everyday things that we've done with no problem before. But for some reason, one day, the body suddenly decides it's just had enough. I'm your host, Yaling Liu. I'm a chiropractor, and some of these guests are my patients. I've been working with bodies in pain since 1994, and one of my favorite parts of practice is still the time I get to spend connecting with people about life as it relates to their pain. Some of the most significant breakthroughs that I see in practice happen through conversation. It's during these frank discussions that we often stumble upon realizations that can help us move forward. And this is exactly why I want to share them with you here. You're just doing what you should. Have you ever had one of those moments when you get to the other side of an ordeal, and upon reflection, maybe years later, you suddenly see yourself in that situation from a completely different perspective than when you were in the thick of it? Gaining distance and allowing for the contrast of time and space can really transform our outlook and offers us the opportunity to recognize our own fortitude sometimes. I often hear about these kinds of shifts in perspective from my patients about their pain experience. Pain can definitely change how we view ourselves, our past selves, and maybe cause us to worry about the future. But then the absence of pain, once it's gone, can lead to a whole other type of realization. And it's with this thought that today's guest, Jane, starts out her interview with me. It's funny, I was actually thinking about it when I was driving up here that I didn't even realize at the time how much pain I'd been in and for how long until I didn't have it. I'd kind of like endured it for about a year. <laughs> I mean, it got progressively worse, but um, it was weird to think about as I reflected on what we are capable of tolerating, I guess, because it really hurt a lot. And I just sort of thought, oh, I'm stressed out. My upper back is tight or I don't know. You make all these excuses for why you're having pain, trying to rationalize it, I guess. We do try to find reasons for everything. It's normal to want to make sense of our world. The way I see it, an important part of my job is to help patients rationalize their pain. Not so that they blindly accept it and ignore it, but so that they can find a way out of it. They come to see me to find causes, to get that diagnosis of sorts, so that they can gain understanding and know what they're facing. Finding causes and explanations helps to take the fear out of it. And as we know now, by the science, fear really messes with your pain. Actually, what had been hurting was my upper back. That's my right. My low back did not hurt at all because yeah. everything in my upper back was holding on. I had forgotten about Jane's upper back pain, which is what she first came to see me for. When I was preparing to sit down with her for this conversation, the main thing on my mind was a spectacular episode of lower back pain that I found really interesting, partly because of how severe it was. And I think it's what led to some important changes in perspective for her. The point that Jane is making here is that her sense of what happened is that the upper back tension was in some way keeping her from succumbing to the issue that was actually brewing in her lower back all this time. Tension in neighboring areas to the problem is in fact a common occurrence. Adaptation to dysfunction is the name of the game. It is how we put up with less than ideal conditions for years and years without realizing that we're undergoing any legitimate strain at all. Very often, where we feel it isn't where the problem is. When one area of the body's compromised, other areas take over. If you twist your ankle, for example, you can't bear full weight on it, your other leg, and maybe your arms, if you're using crutches, will take more of a workload until your ankle is better and better able to return to full function. 
This happens to lesser degrees any time there's perceived stress in the body at any level. For Jane, the pain and tightness that was on her radar first was in the upper back. She'd been getting massage to help manage that for years. This sort of constant tension or discomfort means that you're carrying a certain load. Your body is adapting to something that isn't quite right. So when we sustain an impact on top of that load, either physically, biochemically, or emotionally, there is always going to be a reaction. We only notice that reaction if the impact exceeds our ability to adapt, causing the load to spill over, which then gives us that full-blown pain episode. I bruised my tailbone really badly the year before. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was the second or third time that I had done that. So forgot about that. Yeah. So yeah. I I had was on a boat and you know, we went over this really huge wave and I I smacked my tailbone down mm. on the seat, but it was, you know, a big, a big impact. That was the start of the, this yeah, this round. And my tailbone got better, but it was a cumulative thing and so I think that I mean, who knows? We yeah. don't know exactly yeah. what caused it. We like to make sense of things and figure out what caused what. I'm pretty sure that that was definitely a contributing factor. A fun boat ride on choppy water. No big deal, right? Well, if you're taken by surprise by a big wave and smack your butt on the seat, it can actually be the equivalent of a really hard fall. Jarring impact like this delivers what we would call axial compression forces into the spine. Compression is something we're experiencing all day long thanks to gravity. If you sometimes feel shorter at the end of a long day, That's axial compression at work. Other mechanical forces like this that we tolerate daily and actually need to some degree include lengthening, like when we stretch to reach for something, and shearing, like when we turn our head to check the blind spot while driving. All three, compression, lengthening, and shearing, are absolutely no problem most of the time. Again, it's just when we exceed a certain load for each or all three that we feel it. So what do you do if you know you've just sustained a compressive stress? Well, we typically don't do anything until things hurt, so try to remember that by the time something minor causes you pain, it's probably not the first time your body has put up with it and tried to adapt. It's just the first time your body's letting you know. So it's not an overreaction to try to tend to it right away. A really nice way to diffuse many types of back pain early on is to take a break from being upright and allow your spine to find its neutral shape where all muscles can disengage. This rest period reassures your nervous system that there's no reason for alarm. Usually, it'll involve some variation of lying down on your back with support under the low back, knees, and neck. And maybe taking some deep breaths while you're at it. It was so painful. Mm. It was fascinating to me, just realizing that just being still and allowing my everything to calm down, what a huge effect that had yeah it was very cool actually I remember it vividly just sort of never giving myself permission to do that but I but of course I never had a back injury before and I was okay I'm really gonna try this I'm gonna see if it works I'm gonna pay attention because usually as you as I've told you I would try to plow through things and no I can do that no I'm strong you know I don't need to but I, I really listened that time. I don't know why, but maybe because I was terrified because it was my back and I was really worried that I... High stakes. Yeah, yeah, high yeah. stakes, exactly. Yeah, and because I'd never really had any kind of pain like that before, ever, you know? I had. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'd been really lucky. I hadn't, you know, I'd had things here and there with sports or with, you know, s- stuff, but nothing that was chronic that had lasted that long that was that uncomfortable. And then... When it, when it finally, when my low back finally did sort of give out after the upper back couldn't hold it anymore. Yeah, I just never experienced anything like that where, where I couldn't power through it and I had to actually leave work. And I mean, I remember you helping me out to the car. Like I was felt it was bizarre. It was, I felt so vulnerable. I think you're right. I think it's because I had been always so strong and because I just never had anything that kind of discomfort before. For Jane, a woman who was in her mid-50s when this happened, to never have had a back injury before that, to me, that seems exceptional because I see so many people struggle with various strains at many younger ages. Most people I see and take care of are less inclined to give themselves permission to push the pause button, even when the body's screaming for it. 
Caring for ourselves by just taking a step back to reassess and recover is not easy. I mean, how many of you still drag yourselves through your day when you're sick, trying to pretend that you're fine? Staying home to rest is just not most people's reality. It's a complete luxury. I wanted to know from Jane how or if fear of decline caused her pain to be worse. I think at first it made my pain worse, absolutely. I, I, because I couldn't, because I was so afraid. And so that tightens everything up and it just exacerbates it. But I think one of the things I've learned over these years of working with you and thinking about it a lot and trying to deal with it is how much more control I feel like I actually have over the pain if I don't fight it instead of resisting it and just being afraid of it. I've, I've done this weird thing of both intellectualizing it in a way because I want to understand what's happening with my body, but also going into the pain and knowing how to be with it somehow. I don't know how else to explain it. Jane seems to be reiterating some ideas that have come up in previous episodes. Going into the pain? That's something that Kelly really advocated for too. Understanding and questioning or intellectualizing is something that we heard worked really well for Alice when she talked about taking on the status quo in matters of her own health care. Having more control over pain by not fighting it is a notion that Steve touched on when he talked about breathing and thinking of his pain from a philosophical perspective. So already this show is revealing that many of us, even if we're on different parts of the path with our unique pain experiences, we do seem to encounter similar points of reflection along that path. I wanted to understand it yeah. instead of just making it go away, which I, th- I, which I guess, and from talking to other people, I think a really common response is just make it stop. And I, and I get that because I understand how we all want to do that. We don't want to feel that pain. But yeah, I kind of feel really lucky that I have been able to think it through and I feel like I have a lot more control over it now. How do you keep yourself from just wanting to make the pain stop without letting yourself learn from it and find more sustainable relief? Is it that we just don't know that longer lasting relief is possible if we stop to listen instead of just turning off the pain? Jane's process is a great example of how learning to change her approach has given her confidence and a sustainable pain relief that she doesn't have to rely on medication for. The key, I think, is to seeing these changes as smart rather than a defeat of some sort. She enjoys traveling, and as many of you know, airplane travel is particularly difficult for lower back pain. The hours of sitting subject the spine to a greater compressive force than any other position. Sitting is the worst. But then the pressurized cabin amplifies the compression on your spine, and the bags then that you have to carry with you can sometimes be the last straw. So when you can't avoid travel and all that comes with it, the best you can do is to find out how to cope with the fallout, if there is any, once you arrive at your destination. Aside from just seeking out a local body worker, which I've definitely found myself needing to do a few times. Flying, instead of just freaking out about it and worrying about it, I thought, oh, well, I'm going to try some things that have worked for me before. So that's where the intellect is like working. But then what I did was physically just lie down and think about it and almost do sort of that creative visualization where you just think about lengthening your spine and if anything's compressed here, I want to try to relax it. And I just did that and it worked. (laughs) So I don't know exactly how that works, but, you know, it's a combination of stretching and thinking about it and instead of just pushing back against it. Now, there's another cool way to take control. Visualization. Using your mind's eye to create ease within your body. You know, athletes have been doing this for decades, and there are studies that show there are superior results from athletes who practice and perfect executing their respective performances mentally before ever physically stepping foot into a competition. When you realize how you've changed and how you do things in order to avoid pain, do you think this is reasonable or is it overprotective? For example, strategizing to turn over in bed so that you won't tweak something, or changing your sleep position altogether. Does it make you feel defeated by pain, or are you outsmarting it? 
It's a pretty fine line, isn't it? Because of the pain, what have you had to change? Well, I mean, obviously physical things that I did and never thought about before. Um, gardening, yoga, things that where I know that I've bent over a million times and, and that, that seems to be one of the things that really exacerbates it. And, I, you know, other things I like, you know, standing desk, I stand, you know, things that I would just never really thought about before with the realization that that's, you know, I feel a lot better if I really do not sit as much. I don't lift anything really heavy anymore. I used to just lift up whatever I wanted. I just say, well, I probably shouldn't do that because I'll probably, I could hurt myself. I've definitely been a lot less carefree about what I do physically. Doesn't mean that I feel totally limited. I don't because I, some of the stuff's been kind of fun, like figuring out how to travel super light. I always like to do anyway, but now, man, I've got it down and then I can go for two weeks and just have this tiny little bag, you know, wow. I just have my, do some hand washing, you know, while I'm, you know, I just figured out, I don't want to be able to lift up my bag while I'm traveling and I don't want to have to schlep a lot of stuff. So smart. Yeah. That's so, good. Yeah. So there's side some, benefit. yeah, side benefits. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah. I like that you don't seem sad about the changes. Well, I mean, it depends. Yeah. I mean, I think I, I feel, I feel good that I figured it out and I'm not going to just keep hurting myself, but it doesn't mean I don't grieve about not being able to do everything like that I used to be able to do because I, mm -hmm. I do. But I think that's part of aging too. I mean, you're already in many ways, I mean, there's a whole bunch of different things you're letting go of, I think, as you get older. So it's an interesting time in my life because I think that was that's part of aging anyway. Things mm -hmm. change and some of it we do gracefully and some of it we don't. And yeah. we're at, that's a constant balancing act for me, wanting to not give up and say, oh, I'm old, I can't do that. But at the same time, realize what that they're, I'm definitely different, like I am. I do hope that Jing does, and I think she will get to a place where she feels less tentative and her new ways just become second nature while still living life fully. But I encourage the caution that helps overperformers like Jane, people with high expectations of themselves, to just reevaluate and reset these expectations and see that it is not a failure to change their standards of performance if doing so results in better quality of life. Hey, do you use a standing desk? What do you think? Has it helped? It can lead to different problems related to standing all day. The best situations are the ones where you can alternate standing and sitting with ease. And then, in my opinion, and I think there are studies to back this up, forget what your parents probably told you. Do not sit still. If you can, be what I like to think of as an active sitter. Fidget, be restless, wiggle around, then you'll be better off during those times when you can't avoid sitting. I hear a lot from people who are very frustrated that they can't do their usual thing. And then I hear what their usual thing is and I think, I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and they've been doing that for how long? Mm -hmm. So you're... People say gardening and I think, oh, you know, picking the weeds out, but you're like, you're moving dirt and picking up I bags. Like, you know, like stuff. 50 pound wheelbarrows <laughs> up and down a hill, you know, just like take a big bag, sl sl sling it over my shoulder. I mean, I did that always. Yeah. I mean, even if I wasn't gardening, I was, I was never like a marathon runner or anything like that. I didn't have that kind of endurance. I was strong, like for short bursts, like I could do, you know, That's really and handy. I really prided myself on that. You've probably heard the term weekend warrior. But if you haven't, it's when sedentary desk-bound office workers decide that on the weekends, they are athletes and suddenly push themselves to do things that they have not consistently trained for or conditioned themselves for. This, like many other things, is something we can get away with for a long time. But one day, it becomes more clear that we can't expect to jump into action after a week of stillness without feeling some discomfort in the body. So in my opinion, it's less about rolling over to the changing, aging body and more about getting realistic about what it takes to cultivate the kind of body that can lift and hoist and work hard for short bursts. It's still possible at advanced ages to do these things, but it takes much more of a commitment to condition the body on a regular basis. Everything as we get older demands consistency and care, and I think it's all about our priorities and perspective, how much work we decide we can or want to put into it. 
You don't have to be a Jack LaLanne at age 90, but he is one really good example that you can be if that's what matters to you. In my ongoing quest for insights, I ask Jane the question I'm asking everybody. When pain does strike, what is it that helps you? For me, especially in the last 20 years, is it's never been one thing. It's usually been a combination of things, and it's hard to figure out exactly what the right order is because I think with some of the guidance I've gotten, I just keep trying different things to see what works and because I'm not really willing to accept that there's no solution. So I like that. I think <laughs> so that I, might be play a big role. Well, I think it I think it does for sure. Which is also why I think I have a really difficult time with Western medicine and because mm-hmm. there's usually just one answer and I don't really I don't really go for that. There's also an acceptance that has to happen. Oh. It's, I think that there's an interesting balance there between definitely wanting to fix it or make it better and how do you internalize that? while accepting your limitations at the same time. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And changing limitations, right? I hear you saying that with the aging process Mm -hmm. being sort of on the forefront too. And I really, I don't, I fight against that idea. I don't want to ever give the patient, any patient, an idea that, well, you're getting old. Oh, yeah. That Mm -hmm. seems so wrong. But at the same time, you're saying it's a good idea to accept that things are changing. I agree with that, that I don't, I don't want to feel that way either. And I don't think, I mean, it's certainly not in my head. I'm not like that at all. Like I'm, you're getting old, but I guess it definitely physically you're different. You're, you're different for sure. Acceptance is really important. And I like that Jane accepts the reality of changing body needs, but not that there are no solutions or just one solution. This reminds me of last week's vibrant 87-year-old guest, Alice. She advocated strongly for never accepting no as an answer and always questioning to find solutions that feel right for each of us. I definitely think acupuncture and um, I really do feel like some of like the dietary things, especially in the last couple of years, I mean, the whole gluten thing. And then, you know, lately I've been trying to like eat very few grains and no, I'm not eating any packaged food right now. I don't know if I told you that. Like, I'm just, oh, yeah, I'm yeah. trying to just eat real food. Yeah, single ingredient food. Yeah. Yeah. It's made a huge difference in my digestion. And I think yeah. it's funny because I was actually thinking that when I was traveling, you know, my digestion is not as good. And I also think that contributes. If there's anything going on there, it is so close to my low back that it, I think it to- totally affects it. Weren't you dealing with them? chronic bloating or something. Yeah, well, that was all related. That was yeah. all That was all the stuff. So I'm sure that impacted too. Mm-hmm. I don't have any of that anymore. Just another place where I was really inflamed, I think. I'm curious what you think about the gluten controversy. Have you become afraid to eat because of the daily conflicting news stories about one thing or another that will surely kill you if you eat it or drink it? If you feel great when you avoid a certain food, then I'm in your corner 100% no matter what the science supposedly says. If you're stressed out about mealtime or social outings because of your restrictions, or you find yourself intermittently binging on the things you're trying to avoid, then it might be time to reevaluate. Is it the food that's wreaking havoc or is it your stress about the food? I don't have time in this short episode to get into the gluten controversy. It's huge. There is legitimate biological intolerance to wheat, and then there is also real biochemical impact by certain pesticides used on our foods. How to weed out what's what in regards to how this all translates for our health and well-being, that's a topic for biochemists, neurologists, biologists, or naturopathic researchers to better address. Years ago, I had a chemical exposure. I worked in a sick building, essentially, and I was exposed to a bunch of chemicals. Well, wait a second. Well, isn't this interesting? So if Jane has prior exposure and lingering chemical sensitivities, this might be why she happens to be sensitive to commercial wheat products. It might not be the gluten as much as it's the chemical sensitivity triggered by trace pesticide byproducts. I had one other instance years ago when I had a chemical exposure. I think I've told you about this. That was actually the very first time, and I was in my 40s, when I also had got felt incredibly vulnerable and that was really difficult for me too so it wasn't as much wasn't the kind of pain we're talking about but I'm just thinking about vulnerability with 
What was it that, how did it manifest for you? Mm -hmm. Well, I'd never had any sensitivities to anything prior to that. So oh. all the food sensitivity stuff, all the, oh. like, I can't be around any volatile compounds. Like I can't walk down an aisle with like fertilizer or paint oh. or perfume or anything now that that's all new since that exposure. So I avoid all that stuff and I get nausea, headache, disorientation. I can taste, if I walk down an aisle with chem that has a lot of chemicals, the first thing I do is I taste it. I'm like the canary in the room now for any anything, pretty much anywhere I am. Wow. That's all new. There's some interesting research that has shown that the U.S. wheat supply is more contaminated than that of the wheat grown in Europe. And it just so happens that Jane has had the experience of eating wheat while abroad and with much less trouble. Neither of us would rule out that overall stress levels while vacationing, in contrast with work stress while at home, might also play a legitimate role. But it does make me wonder about the hypothesis that this increasing epidemic of supposed gluten sensitivity is actually, more often than not, a chemical sensitivity due to the impact on our wheat by the use of pesticides. The point that Jane was making here is that this chemical exposure at work was the first time she remembers feeling vulnerable about her health. This lower back pain was only ever the second time she felt that vulnerable again. Why is vulnerability so hard for us? Is that what makes pain so tricky to deal with? Are we no different than other herd animals? Are we subconsciously worried that we'll get picked on by others if we're seen as weak? Jane said she was working in a sick building. So what exactly makes for what they call a sick building? Well, sometimes it's ventilation problems, and sometimes it's mold, sometimes it's both, but here's what it was at Jane's workplace. There were a bunch of new computers that they brought into the floor where I worked. The chemical that they put over the screen of computers, what for whatever reason, that wasn't affixed properly, so that when they turned all these computers on, it off-gassed. This horrible chemical smell was really bad and it permeated everything, of course, in the carpets and the, you know, everywhere. And then there was a handful of us that were super sick from it and then had ongoing things. And this was 15 years ago, so I still, we suffer a lot less. Chemical exposures are something to be aware of, but we can't always control our exposure. We can, however, take care of how well our body deals with exposure. And for that, I would refer you to a book by Dr. Joseph Pizzorno, one of the founders of Bastyr University, which is an accredited naturopathic college here in Washington State. Dr. Pizzorno so very kindly wrote the foreword to my own book. Among many other things for his profession, he continues to champion research in the field of natural health. One of his recent books is called The Toxin Solution. If you're interested in learning more about chemicals in our life and what there is that you can do to support your body to be less vulnerable to exposures big and small, that's a really good resource to start with. Speaking of sneaky triggers that can end up causing pain, like chemical exposure, there was an interesting thing Jane brought up one year while she was working through a flare-up in the springtime. She seemed to often have flare-ups at this time of year, whether that was the initial upper back tension or her more recent lower back pain. Yeah, what we were talking about was around the anniversary of my mother's death in particular. But, but that's also the like springtime for gardening. So those two <laughs> things coupled together, <laughs> not really sure how to tease out like, you know, because starting in February, you know, I was typically starting uh, towards the end of that month was always digging in the dirt so by the end of March well on my way so it's hard to know too what was what was what but I do know that there have been plenty of years and my mom's been dead for 25 years but I would feel out of sorts for you know a month before and I'd kind of get through the anniversary and then realize why so it yeah. happens both emotionally to me but emotionally and physically I think of course it's connected so yeah I, I think that definitely could be true my time with jane is one of many inspirations that led to the inception of this podcast witnessing her thoughtfully and diligently work through this first time experience of debilitating pain inspired me to seek out a way to try and capture and share these moments that happen for so many people during this process because I see a lot of patterns and similarities, I believe that if everyone could hear and see everyone else's struggles, we would all find much greater ease through these difficult times, whether it's physical or emotional pain or both. 
So I remember on numerous occasions with Jane during treatment when after something she said, I'd find myself saying to her, oh, I wish I had that on tape. You've got to hang on to the whatever that was for when I interview you for the podcast. But since it's not quite that easy, what you hear now is Jane struggling to remember at my request what some of those realizations and gems were way back when. There was one time when I was lying down, I was, had some really great epiphany about my pain. <laughs> um, I, think, I think it was more just talking about feeling my way in, going inward. I think that was, I can't remember exactly what I said, but I feel like that's, that's been huge for me that ability to sort of think about it not in an isolated way, not just where you're just focusing on the pain, but in fact thinking about what what may be going on in your body and just feeling like you have some control over doing that if you really put your mind to it. Not in a, like, I have to fix this way, but I actually feel like I probably have some ability to impact this. Mm. So it's an interesting sort of balance of not taking 100% responsibility for it because I think I understand well enough now that we can't always do that, even though I would like to be able to fix everything myself, but that I definitely have more control than I would have, than I might have imagined or more ability to impact it on my own. Not that I don't need help from other people because I do, because I would have never been able to do it without your treatment and Susan and Jasmine. And, but somehow that's, part of the whole community of healing, right? That you mm-hmm. make use of things that other people do for you and help you with. But I don't think, I think one then really has to participate in it too. It can't just be that you're on the receiving end of all of it. I feel like it's much more, at least from my, in my experience, has been much more beneficial if I'm a real partner in it. I want to be the biggest part of it if I can. I always want to understand things. And so I feel like that contributes as well. One of the things that I've learned the most is about being patient because a lot of it doesn't come quickly. Mm-hmm. And I think once you accept that, you're able to realize that, that you don't give up. But I think oftentimes if things aren't immediate for people, they just give up and they think, oh no, this, is, this doesn't work. I don't know how I know that if I just keep going, It'll work, but it usually does. And sometimes it's a different combination of things, but part of this, I think, is absolutely persistence and because you, you have to be patient. If you're going to give yourself the chance to see things from the other side of an ordeal with fresh eyes, like Jane shared with me at the beginning of this conversation, you need time and distance, which means the very best thing you can do is to be patient and don't give up. Thanks, Jane. I do feel like um, it would be kind of interesting, though, to, to some of the people you've talked to, to just think about the what causes those or, or how those epiphany moments are different than something. I don't, I don't know how to even. I don't even know. This, sure right? That, yeah, it's this. I'm not sure what I want to say about this because there's nothing wrong with this. But it's not the same. But it's not the same. And um, yeah, I also, but I, I think it is totally you're, you're laying down. Probably your eyes are closed. You're really going inward. It's just it's just a different yeah. way of processing. It doesn't mean it's not really a judgment on one or the other. They're just different. Yeah, this is sort of a, I'm noticing with everybody I'm talking to. It's very much like okay. So what was it that was so you know? <laughs> right? You have to kind of go back there and <laughs> recreate that. That wraps up another conversation about everyday pain. <gasps> If you have thoughts about this episode or you want to share your own experience with pain, please join our growing community at the Everyday Pain Forum on Facebook groups. If groups aren't your thing, you can just like and follow the Everyday Pain Guide Facebook page or check out tweets by at No Everyday Pain. Organized Sound Productions is responsible for the serious audio magic that makes these episodes work. 
Our theme music is by Eric and Magill, and you can check out the other artists and businesses featured in this podcast by going to stopeverydaypain.com, where you'll find all the episodes and more. For privacy, when requested, guests' names are altered. Please also remember these episodes are never intended to serve as medical advice. Thanks so much for listening, and until next time, I hope you also find a way to connect and talk about your own pain. Uh-huh.